Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. As we go through the book of Esther and you see the ineptitude of King Ahasuerus and how he utterly abdicates the basic responsibilities of his throne and he just goes along with anything that anyone says man it can it can trouble your heart sometimes you look at guys like Haman in the book of Esther and you see how this man this murderous weasel is able to just gain so much power it can be disheartening especially as you know that like things don't change there's nothing new under the sun everything that was is and what's now will be again if the lord tarries it can be it can be discouraging and i want to show you a proverb that will give you some peace uh looking at the book of esther and looking at modern day political turmoil this is something that soothes my soul no matter who's in office. It's Proverbs 21, and it's the very first verse. A king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. He did this with Cyrus. He is doing it in our study in Esther with King Ahasuerus. He has done it in the American government, and he will do it again. He is able. He is sovereign. He is the author of history. All of it is his. And so the king's heart, he may think that he's autonomous. He may even claim Invictus as the anthem of his soul. He may call himself a self-made man. But God named Cyrus before Cyrus was even born. That's where the Persian Empire came from. God is the one who knew about the U.S. before the U.S. even started. The king's heart is not his own. Even a king who professes disbelief in God. Just ask Pharaoh, man, for crying out loud. This is one of the biggest examples, one of the earliest examples in Scripture. This guy was an Egyptian Pharaoh who thought that he was a deity. He did not worship God. In fact, he hated God. In fact, his people at one point had killed the firstborn of all the Jewish people, and they were in the process of trying to kill and steal away even the baby boys of Egypt. And so you can see how it was retributive justice and, uh, and uh, on God's part to even slaughter the firstborn of the Egyptians. This guy did not respect Yahweh. He did not worship the Lord. He resorted to pagan trickery. He, he worshiped Hecate. He worshiped Horus or Ra. He, he worshiped the Egyptian pantheon. And yet God would harden his heart for the very purpose of creating the nation of Israel and simultaneously demonstrating the impotence of the Egyptian pantheon. We can see clearly in the book of Exodus that in the majority of the plagues, Pharaoh's heart was hardened of his own volition, but there are also plagues wherein God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay, see that? A king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. If you were to ask Pharaoh, if you were to ask Ahasuerus, if you were to ask Cyrus, if you were to ask even the men who crucified Jesus, right? if you were to ask them, they, they would tell you that what they were doing was absolutely justified. And they would have thought themselves acting on their own volition. Pilate thought that he could wash his hands of the matter. Herod kept trying to just avoid responsibility, but all he ended up doing was playing ping pong until eventually he helped set up the crucifixion too. A king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. Do you see the, the contrast here? In a king's heart, which the king, see this possessive apostrophe here? He thinks that it's his own heart, but it's the Lord who is choosing how things go. So we see kings make decisions of their own volition and then live with it, but we also see God override the free will as is his prerogative of a king to bring about his sovereign will. It is absolutely God's right to intervene, to put his hand down and then direct the water where it should flow 
as he is the one who is sovereign over time. There's not a single historical event. There's not a single edict ever de- ever issued. There's not a single decree ever made. There's never a, a single law ever penned that freaks God out as though he didn't see it coming. He can, at any moment, step in and intervene. And in fact, the final book of the Bible shows him saying, excuse me for a minute, I'm going to come down there and reign myself and show you how this is done. And he's going to do it for a thousand years. And you know what's going to be funny? He's going to have a lot of haters. (laughs) He's going to be the perfect king. And still, there will be hard-hearted people. There's not going to be a single person left at the end of the book of Revelation whose heart is not so ridiculously hardened that they don't willingly go to hell without the least without the least bit of shock. Every one of them knows exactly what's going on. So don't be stressed politically, okay? And as you study the book of Esther and you see King Ahasuerus, I want you to remember this proverb because God's the one who's really in control. Even though Ahasuerus seems happy to toss his signet ring in the direction of anyone with an idea and a pulse, God's the one who's really in control here. God is about the business of delivering the people of God in the book of Esther. And nothing about Proverbs 21 verse 1 has changed. Romans chapter 13 gives us a reminder of this. Even in the New Testament context, there were certain duties that were carried out in the context of the Levite priesthood as Old Testament Israel was to live as a theocratic nation. And there are some of those duties that have now been assigned to the governments that exist today. But Proverbs 21 verse 1 is still true because even though it's a different covenant, it's the same God, the same heart, the same character, and the same exact perfect agenda. So don't be stressed out politically. Let Proverbs 21 verse 1 be a salve over your heart. Let the book of Esther be beautiful, exquisite biblical proof of exactly this concept. Even when leaders seem to abdicate their responsibility, God never abdicates his. He's the one who's sovereign. He's the one who's writing the story.